Good evening and welcome. Welcome to Boston College. For those of you who are alumni, perhaps of the IREPM, I want to say a warm welcome home and welcome back. My name is Jean Chizer and I am one of the assistant directors at the IREPM and I oversee the continuing education program. Uh, we welcome you here tonight to what we call our opening lecture or our kickoff lecture for our year. And I wanted to just briefly mention the scope of the continuing education program. You're all here for one of our lectures. At the end of the year, in April, Elizabeth Johnson will be here, and she will be giving a lecture with the same title, The, church, the Faith That the Church Hands On. So we have two people from Fordham opening and closing for us this year. Also want to tell you about some workshops. If you didn't have a chance to pick up one of our brochures, please feel welcome to do that. They're on the table outside. And another handout for you that you may have gotten is C21 Update. It's all the programs um, through the Church in the 21st Century Center. And that has all kinds of programs that you may be interested in as well. I also wanted to take just a few seconds to talk about our online program, which is C21 Online. You can log on and learn from the comfort of your own home from all over the world. So please check that out for us as well. Finally, I would like to introduce very briefly uh, Dr. Thomas Groom. He is a man with vision and with drive, and he's the IREPM's director. It was Tom's idea to invite the Cardinal here tonight having met the Cardinal personally and studied with him many years ago. And it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Groom, who will introduce the Cardinal tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And let me thank Jean for a wonderful work that she has done in lining up a marvelous continuing education program for us and for our pastoral institute uh, this year. And as she indicated, there are all kinds of uh, varied offerings of seminars and brown bag lunches at lunchtime and uh, uh, public lectures like this one, so do pick up our brochure. Uh, that's the end of station identification. Let me move on and say that it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce um, Cardinal Avery Dulles to you this evening, Cardinal Dulles of the Society of Jesus, with this opening lecture of our continuing education curriculum. It has often been said that probably the most, the most distinguished, the most selective society in the world is the Catholic Church's College of Cardinals. And indeed it is a selective and a distinguished uh, gathering. And we are most honored to have one of them to grace us, literally grace us with his presence here this evening. I'm convinced, however, that Cardinal Dulles is even more distinguished than most cardinals uh, can claim to be. As you know, most cardinals um, rise to their high station by working their way up through the ranks of bishops, typically coming up out of a smaller diocese to a larger diocese and eventually to a metropolitan diocese and then like Boston or Chicago or uh, New York or Berlin or London or Dublin or someplace and indeed being elevated to the cardinalate then because they're the primates of a great metropolitan see or they can also come up through the ranks, of course, of the Vatican Diplomatic Corps or the Curial Offices. And again, rising as bishops through the ranks to archbishop and eventually, if they become secretaries of, uh, of congregations and Vatican congregations, then indeed they're elevated to cardinal. Once in a very rare, rare while, the church chooses one of its theologians that in fact is not a bishop, at least not when he's chosen, uh, to become a cardinal, and it's a rare, rare event. So rare that even the most pretentious of us never aspire uh, to the august <laughs> distinction. Uh, and for whatever reason, never before uh, has an American theologian, Catholic theologian, been uh, chosen for this august honor until the church chose Avery Dulles. Uh, it was a great distinction, not only for Avery, but indeed for American Catholic theology when Avery was elevated and chosen by Pope John Paul II and elevated to Cardinal. It is the highest honor that our church can bestow upon one of its members, at least on this side of eternity. 
I suppose when you're a while dead and have three first-class miracles to your credit, they will raise you to the altar as a saint. But short of that, the next best thing in our church is indeed to become a cardinal. In this light, as you might suspect, uh, Cardinal Dulles, his, his resume is more than impressive. Uh, let me just give some highlights. He's currently the Lawrence J. McGinley Professor of Religion and Society at Fordham University, a position he has held since 1988. He was born in Auburn, New York, on August 24th, 1918. And those of you good at math will give praise to God for such a blessed and long life. He's the son of John Foster Dulles, and you historians and people of my vintage will remember his father as the American Secretary of State in the Eisenhower cabinet. Uh, the son also of Janet Pomeroy Avery Dulles, his mom, graduated from Harvard College in 1940, the year that he also converted to Catholicism. He spent a year and a half at Harvard Law School, and then, as he was telling us tonight, over dinner at Pearl Harbor happened, and he enlisted in the U.S. Navy and emerged some years later with the rank of lieutenant. Upon his discharge from the Navy in 1946, Avery Dulles entered the Society of Jesus, was ordained to the priesthood in 1956, went on to study at the Gregorian University in Rome, and was awarded the Doctorate in Sacred Theology in 1960. Cardinal Dulles served on the faculty of Woodstock College in New York, the great, uh, well, beginning at Woodstock, and I encountered it in New York. From 90, he was on the faculty at Woodstock, the Je Jesuit Seminary of the New York province, from 1960 to 1974. It was actually during my own doctoral work at Columbia and Union Theological that I had the privilege of studying with then Father Dulles and uh, because I had taken a great deal of my own theology courses at Woodstock, which was just around the corner, as it were, from Columbia and Union. After Woodstock in 74, he went on to the Catholic University of America in 1974, 1998, 1988 rather, and then since then has been at Fordham with intermittent visiting professorships at many universities, the Gregorian in Rome, Western Jesuit School of Theology, Princeton, Yale, Oxford, Boston College, and Notre Dame, uh, just to name a few. Uh, he's the author of over 750 articles, published essays, on theological topics and 22 books, which um, even to the most industrious of us is stupendous, uh, extraordinary productivity. An all-time favorite, of course, was his Models of the Church of 1974. His most recent book is on John Henry Newman and how fitting that is because Newman, of course, was one of the other few non-bishop theologians to be made a cardinal. He's past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, the American Theological Society, has served in various national and international theological papal commissions, is a, a consultant to the Committee on Doctrine of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. As you might suspect, he has an impressive collection of awards, including the Boston College Presidential Bicentennial Award and holds no less than 35 honorary doctorates. Almost 60 years ago, Cardinal Dulles wrote a book entitled A Testimonial to Grace, the account of his conversion to Catholicism. And in my conversations with him, I invited him to return to some of those memories, to revisit them, to be retrospective, but also to be prospective because our theme this year is handing on the faith. And so my question to him and my invitation to reflect upon it with us was to indeed lay out his hope for the faith that he wants the church to pass on, coming out of his own memories, but looking into the legacy that he leaves us as well. Let me end on a personal anecdote and a note and also a word of gratitude to Cardinal Dulles because I can honestly say that I owe my first gainful employment to Cardinal Dulles and to the recommendation that I was told later that he gave me because it was the summer of 1975 there was a faculty search going on at the Catholic University of America for a junior appointment in religious education. And literally out of the blue and without ever having applied for the position, I got a phone call, was invited down to Catholic U, what I thought was for interviews, 
and needing to impress them with my brilliance and my spanking new PhD or doctorate from Columbia and Union. And instead, I found myself being courted and wined and dined, and they, in a sense, lobbying me to take the job. And of course, I wondered why. It was late July at the time, and classes began in September. And in good, um, in good Irish Catholic fashion, I just presumed they couldn't find anybody else. Uh, and that indeed may have well have been the truth. But what was reported to me later, by the chair of the search committee, Father Berard Marthaler, was that he recognized on my resume a reference to coursework I had done with Avery, and he asked, met Avery in the corridor, he was then teaching at Catholic U at the time, and said, raise my name with him, and at least what was reported to me was, Avery allegedly said, well, Tom got an A in my course, and one of the few I gave that year. <laughs> As the saying goes, the rest is history. A man of such good judgment, no wonder, no wonder they made him a cardinal. Let us welcome Cardinal Avery Dulles. After that wonderful introduction, it can only be downhill from here. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It's very nice to be with you again, to be here at Boston College again, to be in the Gasson Hall, since I was the Gasson professor for a couple of years, around in the early 80s. And so I feel very much at home here. And uh, uh, when, I became, when I become Pope, I will think about other possibilities of the Cardinal H. And uh, there's nothing uh, in divine law, it seems to me, that uh, limits it even to clerics. So uh, <laughs> uh, I have a Dominican nun uh, as my assistant, and I promised her if I was elected pope, she would be my first appointment as Cardinal Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, that was not the case. I miss, missed out this time, but there are always future elections. <laughs> so let me begin with a word about my title, the, the Faith That the Church Hands On. This presentation, I am told, belongs to a series on the topic, Handing On the Faith. To make my lecture somewhat distinctive, Dr. Groom suggested the title, The Catholic Faith That I Want Handed On. I modified this title by omitting the reference to myself because I find in myself no desire except that the true faith, the faith of the church, be handed on. But I did state in advance uh, that uh, I would say something about my own journey of faith over the past seven decades, and this I shall do very briefly as I begin. At the time I entered college at a sister institution of yours across the River Charles, uh, I felt a great need to find whether human life had any meaning were we rational beings misfits in a brutal, irrational universe of matter pushed around by chance? Or was there an order of values worth pursuing and a goal calling for all the love and loyalty that human persons were capable of giving? My studies in classical philosophy set me on the path toward an answer. Aristotle taught me that human reason is a precious instrument for penetrating more deeply into the heart of reality rather than something that alienates us from the world. Things had final as well as efficient causes. Plato taught me that the human spirit is capable of recognizing what is truly and objectively good and of adhering to it even when it requires sacrifice. 
his maxim that it is better to suffer injustice than to commit injustice came to me with the strength of a revelation. But Plato himself could speak of the goal of human life only in vague myths to be clung to in the absence of a divine revelation. Then I turned to the New Testament and found a kind of Christian Platonism in the writings of John and Paul, a deeper and loftier vision of eternal truth based on Jesus Christ as the divine revealer. St. Augustine helped me to develop this beguiling Christian Platonism in my studies of medieval history, I found that the Catholic faith could sustain a rich intellectual and artistic culture. Medieval cathedrals such as Chartres symbolize the unity and complexity of medieval culture, as did the majestic summas of scholastic theology and monumental poems of Dante and Chaucer. Turning to the 16th century, I found that the Protestant reformers, unintentionally, no doubt, shattered the religious coherence of European culture. In my study of the Council of Trent, I found the Catholic positions more reasonable and attractive, at least to myself, than the views they condemned. The Enlightenment and the age of positivism further undermined the religious consciousness, leading to the directionless world of our own day. In the Catholic literature that fell into my hands, I found congenial spirits who shared my regrets and my nostalgia for the past. Thomist philosophers such as Jacques Maritain and Etienne Gilson represented a renewed medievalism that raised my hopes that it might be possible to recover some of the lost ground. I also discovered in a city like Cambridge a vibrant living Catholicism. St. Paul's Church in the shadow of Harvard University was regularly filled with worshipers who prayed in Latin and sang Latin hymns, some of them composed by Thomas Aquinas. Inspired by this theological vision, that animated the alternate, the alternative culture, uh, I asked to be admitted to the Catholic Church. Until the Second Vatican Council, I remained a firm Thomist, or if you like, neo-Thomist. But the Council seemed to require a change of attitude. It invited Catholics not to lament the present and pine for a restoration of the past. It urged them to enter fully into the modern world. I was forced reluctantly to recognize that the church must move with the times. During the 1960s and early 1970s, I was part of an adapting church, seeking to explore how far Catholic doctrine and discipline would have to be modified to conform to the directives of Vatican II. I never joined the avant-garde that bitterly attacked the Pope and the Roman Curia for their alleged conservatism. I wanted to retain at all costs the dogmatic heritage of the past. I did not dissent from Humane Vitae and other unpopular decisions of the Holy See. And yet I did not attack the dissenters. 
I felt that more time was needed to appraise new proposals based on contemporary insights. About 1975 or 1976, I began to feel the need to express my reservations about radical currents of secularization, which in my judgment were unhelpful to Catholic faith and life. I became increasingly cautious about what changes to accept. It has become necessary to assert more firmly than before that in spite of all adaptations in style and language, the faith of the church remains substantially unchanged. Mine is the faith of John and Paul, Athanasius and Augustine, Anselm and Thomas, Bellarmine and Newman. To profess that faith with confidence today, one must be critical of the reigning ideologies. Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI have rightly put us on guard against metaphysical agnosticism and relativism. These trends make it difficult and almost impossible to hand on the faith that I had come to love, a theme to which we may now turn our attention. The term faith can be taken in either of two senses, subjective and objective. Subjectively, it is the act or virtue characteristic of the believer. By faith, we adhere personally to God, submitting our minds and will to him. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, from which I take this description, makes the further point that faith, subjectively understood, has two inseparable aspects, personal adherence to God and assent to God's word. If we withheld assent to God's word, we would not be personally adhering to him. And conversely, if we did not adhere to God personally, we would not be able to have faith in his word. But faith has an objective meaning as well. When we speak of the Catholic faith, we mean the body of truth that the Catholic Church believes and hands on. This is the topic of my lecture. Theologians sometimes speak of the faith as having three attributes, divine, Christian, and Catholic. It is divine insofar as it is revealed by God. It is Christian insofar as it goes out to Christ as the mediator and fullness of all revelation. And it is Catholic insofar as it has the Church of Christ as its authorized witness. These are not three faiths, but three ways of looking at the one faith, which is a body of truth revealed by God, mediated through Christ the incarnate word, and transmitted by the church. Paul in Ephesians teaches explicitly that faith is one. Although faith is one and indivisible, our limited human minds are not capable of grasping it as a whole by a single act. We therefore break up the object into a number of articles of faith, such as those of the creed. These articles fall into two main groups, those dealing with God, the primary content of faith, and those dealing with things other than God insofar as they are related to him. The Greek fathers, pondering the contents of faith, made a distinction between theologia, the study of God in himself, and oikonomia, the study of God in terms of what he does, makes, and intends. Theologia includes the study of God in his unity, the divine nature or essence, and of the inner tripersonal life 
the mystery of the Trinity, the economy or the actions and intentions of God may in turn be studied under different aspects such as the works of creation and redemption. Jesus Christ holds a central place in the content of faith because he is a divine person, because all things were created through him, and because he is the universal redeemer. The handing on of the faith is the task of the church. She performs this task by everything she does, but especially by teaching Christian doctrine. Holy Scripture and tradition are, so to speak, the channels that carry the faith down through the centuries. Scripture remains ever fixed as the Word of God in inspired human words. Tradition consists of all other means whereby the Church transmits God's Word in Christ to believers of every age and culture. Education in the Catholic faith takes place on three levels, primary evangelization, catechesis, and theology. Presupposing that the student has become a believer through evangelization and has learned the principal teachings of the church through catechesis, Theology engages in a systematic search for deeper understanding. In his encyclical, Fides et Ratio, Pope John Paul II defines theology as a reflective and scientific elaboration of the understanding of God's word in the light of faith. The Pope goes on to say that to understand revelation and the contents of faith, one must make a careful analysis of the texts of Scripture and those that express the Church's living tradition. Theology has traditionally had a home in Catholic universities, though to, today some deny that theology belongs in the university at all on the ground that it is dogmatic and uncritical Cardinal Newman, among others, brilliantly made the case for giving theology a prominent place in the university because it deals with a significant body of truth that has a bearing on practically every other branch of knowledge. Pope John Paul II, in his Apostolic Constitution, Ex Corde Ecclesiae, taught that theology, together with philosophy, enables university scholars to overcome the fragmentation of disciplines and synthesize their specific contribution in the light of Christ, the Logos, the center of creation and of human history. Because of its specific importance of, among the academic disciplines, he writes, every Catholic university should have a faculty or at least a chair of theology. In an allocution to the most recent General Congregation of the Society of Jesus, the same Pope declared that the teaching of theology in Jesuit universities must, stri must strive to provide students with a clear, solid, and organic knowledge of Catholic doctrine focused on knowing how to distinguish those affirmations that must be upheld from those open to discussion that cannot be, that cannot be accepted, and those that cannot be accepted. For universities, then, the ideal is to impart a clear, solid, and organic knowledge of Catholic doctrine based on Holy Scripture and the Church's living tradition interpreted in accord with the norms laid down by the Catholic magisterium. But as we shall now see, this ideal is difficult to realize in practice even at the university level. For a number of reasons, 
teachers of religion and theology are inclined to avoid focusing on the contents of Catholic faith. One such reason might be the American preoccupation with techniques and methods. As a pragmatic people, we are inclined to look for what William James called the cash value of theory. We specialize in know-how rather than know what. We are constantly experimenting with new ways of communicating, expecting to find some new formula that will pave the way to success. In some ways, it is easier to talk about methods than about content by concentrating on how to proceed rather than what ought to be held, we can avoid some bitter controversies. A second reason for the doctrinal decline in Catholic theology uh, is that uh, Catholic theology has traditionally relied heavily on metaphysics. Natural theology enabled theologians to identify the anthropomorphisms and metaphors in the Bible and to formulate a coherent concept of God. The doctrine of God as personal, infinite, and utterly simple was basic to the Trinitarian theology of the great theological, of the great Catholic tradition. It provided clues for understanding how there could be three divine persons and still only one God. In the past two centuries, natural theology has fallen into disrepute. In the academic world, it is almost taken for granted that this branch of philosophy was demolished by the critiques of Hume and Kant. Hume's skepticism and Kant's assault on metaphysics, whatever their weaknesses, have made a deep impression on many intellectuals. As a result, it takes a person of great courage to base anything today on the metaphysics that undergirded classical theology. A third factor equally deleterious to Catholic to doctrinal theology is the reigning suspicion of authority. Kant himself proclaimed as the first principle of the Enlightenment the slogan sapere aude. Have the courage to use your own intelligence and do not rely on the authority of another. While acknowledging that the clergyman may be required to follow the doctrine of his church, Kant insisted that the scholar in the university has the freedom and in fact the obligation to use his own reason without deference to authority. In matters of religion, Kant believed immaturity is especially unfitting. The fact is, however, that the doctrines of the Catholic faith are received on the basis of authority. They come from revelation, which is transmitted by those who speak and write as inspired and assisted by God. The mysteries of the Christian religion are truths so hidden in God that they are incapable of being discovered by purely rational inquiry. If we reject the authority as a matter of principle, we cannot find a secure basis for holding the doctrines of the church. There is plenty of room for critical reasoning in theology, but unless people accept the authority of accredited witnesses, they cannot be believers or theologians. In the years following Vatican II, many universities converted their departments of theology into departments of religious studies. This shift was motivated by the desire to avoid having to assume a posture of faith. In religious studies, Christianity 
or any other religion can be approached from a non-confessional point of view with the tools of history, sociology, and psychology rather than under the light of faith. Unlike theology, this discipline makes no claim to settle questions of religious truth. A fourth source of difficulty closely related to the third is the pervasiveness of the critical spirit. Since the time of Descartes, the critical program has been dominant in academic circles. Research begins with a bias toward doubt rather than belief. The fiducial component in knowledge is rejected or ignored. The church, on the contrary, insists that faith is the key to understanding. Theology has been defined as fides querens intellectum. In the United States today, it is rare for a university professor to enter the classroom and declare adherence to the, that adherence to the faith is the true path to understanding. A fifth source of difficulty is the contemporary distaste for propositional truth in matters of religion. Some maintain that faith consists in an existential surrender to sheer transcendence and encounter with the ineffable. According to these existential theologians, faith may, to some extent, be expressed in symbols that point to the divine, but the symbols must never be taken literally. On this basis, it is denied that revelation yields any information about God, uh, this world, or the world to come. In existential theology, the term belief is redefined, traditionally viewed as an acceptance of revealed truth on the authority of God the revealer, religious belief is now taken to mean a human effort to express the experience of faith in human language. The statements are symbolic and should not be taken literally. Religious belief in this sense runs no risk of running into conflict with science or history, but it gains this immunity at the cost of being unable to say anything literally true about the things of God. The Catholic Church, however, is firmly committed to the view that the dogmas of the Church, propositional though they be, are revealed truths to be accepted on the authority of God who reveals. They do yield information, for instance, the facts that God is everlasting and that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead. The statements may be analogous, but they are not mere metaphors. A sixth factor that makes it difficult to transmit the doctrines of the church in the classroom is the currency of historicism or cultural relativism that is to say, the conviction that all human truth, uh, all human truth claims are historically and culturally conditioned. Past statements may have been true in the sense of being relatively adequate for their own day, but they can no longer be accepted at face value. Although this kind of historicism contains a modicum of truth, it cannot be defended in the radical form exposed by modernists a century ago or as further radicalized by some postmodernists of our day. Pope John Paul II, in his encyclical on faith and reason, warns against the errors of historicism and postmodernity insofar as they deny 
the enduring validity of truth. A seventh difficulty against the presentation of dogma in educational institutions is the fear of offending the conscientious convictions of some students. In the university, it can by no means be taken for granted that the students are all committed Catholics. A given classroom may well include marginal Catholics, Protestants, Jews, agnostics, atheists, and possibly some Muslims, Buddhists, or Hindus. For such a mixed audience, it seems more tactful not to present ideas that are specific to Catholic Christianity. Historians at historians of Catholic religious of the Catholic religious curriculum have documented the shift from faith-centered courses to offerings that make no reference to any specific sacred order. Before 1965, Catholic universities in the United States usually offered courses on the Trinity, Christology, sin, grace, redemption, sacraments, and the like. Then they introduced courses dealing with ecumenism and comparative religion in which Catholic doctrine was presented as one point of view among others. And finally, after 1975, they began to teach courses that made no reference to the specific beliefs of any religious community. The religious catalogs contained titles such as Affirmation and Doubt in Modern Thinkers, or Global Ethics, or Death and Dying. If consistently applied, this move toward neutrality would deprive the theology department of its reason for existence and would severely limit the power of the university to hand on the faith. An eighth and final difficulty is that relatively few students have the necessary background for theological study. Many do not firmly believe the Catholic faith. Those who do believe may not have been adequately catechized. Theology as a deeper reflection on faith presupposes that the student is prepared to accept the principal articles of the faith as the framework in which theological reflection is conducted. For unprepared students, the discussion of complex theological questions can lead only to frustration and confusion. Even if the faculty attempts to offer traditional courses in dogmatic theology, the current intellectual climate can easily defeat their best efforts. The principal object of faith is uh, the principal article of faith and revelation, according to Catholic teaching, is God himself. Until recently, nearly all Christians would have accepted the classical notion of God, derived from scripture and tradition. The Catechism of the Catholic Church quotes as still valid the following words from the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215. We firmly believe and confess without reservation that there is only one true God, eternal, immeasurable, and unchangeable, incomprehensible, almighty, and ineffable, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons indeed, but one essence, substance, or nature, entirely simple. Cardinal Newman, in his The Idea of a University, has an excellent summary of the classical concept of God. According to the teaching of monotheism, he writes, God is an individual, self-dependent, all-perfect, unchangeable being. 
intelligent, living, personal, and present, almighty, all-seeing, all-remembering, between whom and his creatures there is an infinite gulf, and who has no origin, who is all-sufficient for himself, who created and upholds the universe, who will judge every one of us sooner or later according to that law of right or wrong which he has written into our hearts. Writing these words in 1852, Newman was able to affirm confidently that every Catholic believed this doctrine of God, but he recognized that the belief was contrary to the spirit of his age, in which, he said, authority, prescription, tradition, habit, moral instinct, and the divine influence go for nothing, in which patience of thought and depth and consistency of view are scorned as subtle and scholastic, in which free discussion and fallible judgment are prized as the birthright of each individual. In this respect, Newman's age was not unlike our own. Newman's concept of God agrees with that set forth in 1870 by the First Vatican Council, which proclaimed in the most solemn terms, the Holy Catholic Apostolic and Roman Church believes and confesses that there is one true and living God, creator and Lord of heaven and earth, almighty, eternal, immense, incomprehensible, infinite in intelligence and will, and in every perfection, who, being singular, altogether simple, and unchangeable spiritual substance, is in reality and essence distinct from the world, most blessed in and, in, in and from himself, and ineffably exalted above all things that exist or can be conceived besides himself. This conception of God, which the supreme magisterium of the Church teaches as a matter of faith, plays a crucial role in theology. If it is questioned or denied, the whole edifice of Catholic theology becomes vague and unsteady. New concepts of God imported from pantheism, panentheism, pragmatism, or process philosophy are unacceptable and cannot sustain the system of Catholic dogma. If teachers of theology deny the traditional concept of God or place it in brackets as many are wont to do, they are seriously undercutting all other branches of theology. When assigned to teach Christology, for example, they are strongly tempted to avoid the dogma of the Incarnation, which involves the divine nature of Christ, and start by, pre by preference with the humanity of Jesus. Under the rubric of theology, they discuss the historical Jesus, which is the product of historical method unaffected by revealed truth. Attempting to get at the Jesus of history, they deride or dis they decide to discount the testimony of John and Paul, who speak too dogmatically. They look only at the synoptic gospels and do so very selectively, judging that any claim for the divinity of Jesus cannot belong to the original tradition, but must be an insert of the post-resurrection community. As a result of this approach, the course inevitably comes up with a portrait of Jesus as a late Jewish rabbi, hailed as a prophet, and regarded by some as the promised Messiah. This minimalist approach, more often than not, serves to weaken the faith of the student. A Catholic education should do better for its students. Courses in ecclesiology are likewise emptied of theological content unless they can presume that Jesus, the founder and Lord of the Church, was the Son of God, and that God is the eternal triune being of whom we have spoken. Dogmatically, of course, the Church is to be seen as the mystical body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
commissioned by Christ to be the teacher of all nations until the end of the age. It has become popular in many places to study the church by preference from below, that is to say, as though it were a purely human and historical community, which of course it is not. From this perspective, it becomes impossible to understand why the church should be necessary for salvation. The claim that the church could evan should evangelize all nations can no longer be defended. The teachings of the church cannot be presented as having divine authority. It becomes senseless to speak of the heavenly church or to look forward to the final eschatological fulfillment for which Christians pray. Courses in ecclesiology taught from a non-dogmatic point of view serve to weaken and confuse rather than confirm and clarify the student's faith. If time permitted, we could go on at some length to discuss the impact of modern epistemological assumptions on other areas of theology, for instance, the sacraments. Is sacramental theology taught at all? If so, are the sacraments explained as divinely instituted means of grace? Can the Course take up the, the sacrificial character of the Mass and the real and substantial presence of Christ in the Eucharist? These doctrines must be supported by div divinely authoritative teaching or not at all. In concluding, I could give only a partial answer to the problems I've raised. Philosophers and theologians, I believe, should make it their business to see that pervasive errors such as metaphysical agnosticism and historicism are refuted by solid arguments. Advanced students in these disciplines should learn to tackle such issues. On the college level, courses in the basic doctrines of the church should be offered in courses highly recommended for Catholic students. These courses should be taught from a Catholic point of view in spite of the many objections I have mentioned. Effective measures should be taken to assure that Catholic college graduates will be familiarized with the essential teachings of, the Catholic faith, of Catholic faith and morals. They should also have some idea why the church teaches what she does. They should be equipped to answer common objections to the faith, perhaps through courses in apologetics. They should have taken introductory courses in Holy Scripture and church history so as not to be ignorant of Christian origins and development. The philosophy department should offer courses preferably required that would convey a realist theory of knowledge and a sound metaphysics. In this way, our graduates could be somewhat prepared to stand up against the agnosticism and relativism of the day. Catholic universities have a unique role to play in the culture wars now being waged. They are privileged places in which the church can mobilize her resources to hand on the faith as she must and foster the intellectual and foster the intellectual revolution that Pope John Paul II envisaged in his encyclical on faith and reason. Only when faith and reason embrace in harmony can the human spirit rise to the full heights for which God has destined it. I thank you.